Good evening, everyone. God bless you. God bless you. It is well with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Please, if you can hear uh, the audio, please let me know that the audio is good. It is good. God bless you. God bless you. And our Father, we bless your name this evening. We lift your name on high. You are faithful and good. You are holy, you are righteous, you are the Lord and you never change. You are the almighty, the all glorious, all powerful God, hallowed be your name. We thank you for the grace to return to back in class. We thank you for your presence that's always been with us. We thank you for the grace and mercy that we receive. And tonight, Holy Spirit, we want to see you. We invite you to join us. We want you to be our instructor. We commit this new semester into your hand. We pray that the anointing of ease will rest upon us. We pray that we will not struggle to learn. We will not struggle to understand. We pray that you grant us divine understanding from heaven above in the name of Jesus Christ. So at the end of each session, we have every reason to bless your name. Thank you, Father. We give you praise in Jesus' name. We have prayed. Amen. Amen. Okay, God bless everyone. It's good to be back in class. It is well with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, I know many of us we have spoken, but if we have not spoken since the end of last semester, I say Happy New Year to you. God bless you. This is your year in the name of Jesus Christ. All right. So, a popular survey of the Old Testament, and this class is titled Old Testament Survey, Old Testament Survey. Uh, in the process, we will, go we will touch some of the things that we did in Pentateuch. Sometimes we touch some of the things that we did in historical books, amen? But it's all well and good. All right. Christ and the inspiration of the Bible. That is under uh, the title of chapter one that says Christ is the key to the inspiration and canonization of the Bible. The key to the inspiration and the canonization of the Bible. Yeah, let's look at that introduction to that chapter one. It said, what is the Bible all about? How can I understand its meaning? Why are there 66 books in the Bible? And how do I know it is the word of God? So you continue to say all of these questions can be answered in one word, Christ, Christ, Christ. Christ is right at the center of every page and every chapter of the Bible. Christ is the key, is the key to the interpretation of the Bible. To have a better understanding of the scripture, we need to understand Jesus Christ. Amen? So Christ and the inspiration of the Bible. The New Testament is a historically accurate document. Now, we say it is a historical fact that Jesus Christ lived and taught what the New Testament says he taught. The best source of information about Jesus is the historically uh, verified documents of the New Testament. And I know many, I believe all of us have read the textbook. Then you realize that even the, some historians, Jewish historians, they can prove it. They verify that Jesus lived and walked the earth. And everything is said was true. So they verify it. They, they can prove it. Praise God. So the result of this historical verification of the New Testament 
is that the modern reader can be sure that what the gospels record is indeed what Jesus taught and did. What Jesus taught and did. That is very accurate, is very accurate. Mm. Now Christ and the inspiration of the Bible. Christ and the inspiration of the Bible. Let's look at what Jesus thought about the inspiration of the Bible. The first one, some general claim about the Old Testament. If you can come with me to page 13 of the textbook, you will see it just right there. He said, Jesus said many things about the Old Testament in general, all of which amount to an unmistakable acknowledgement that it is the authoritative and unbreakable word of God. Number one, it says scripture cannot be broken. Scripture cannot be broken, John 10, 35. Number two, it must be fulfilled. It must be fulfilled. When we are talking about scripture in the days of Jesus Christ, they are talking about the Old Testament, the Old Testament. Number three is ignorance of the Old Testament is the source of error, the source of error. And unfortunately today, we, we have so many so-called Christians that don't be, they don't believe in the Old Testament. If you don't believe in the Old Testament, then how can you tell me you believe in the word of God? You cannot believe in some part and you say you believe on the other. If you want to believe the scripture, you have to believe the all and the entire scripture, old and the new, old and the new testament. Because ignorance of the Old Testament is the source of error, the source of error. Number four, Jesus said, till heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. When he's talking about the law, we know he's talking about the Old Testament. Because in the beginning, the Old Testament is divided into two sections, the law and the prophets. The Lord and the prophets. Praise God. And number five is a following Jesus, the New Testament writer also considered the Old Testament to be scripture, which is inspired by God, inspired by God. Now let's look at some specific claims about the Old Testament. So in addition to the general claim, general claims, Jesus made, that Jesus made about the Old Testament, Old Testament inspiration. Can somebody pray for me to get into reading? I think it's been a minute. <laughs> so in addition to the general claims Jesus made about the Old Testament inspiration, there are numerous specific citations of the Old Testament persons and events which reveal what Jesus taught about the authenticity and historical character of the Old Testament. If we pay, if we look at it very well, we see it all the, all that Jesus quoted, he mentioned Abraham, he mentioned Noah, he mentioned uh, Lot, he mentioned Jonah. We say he mentioned Sodom and Gomorrah. So if the Old Testament is not real, then why is Jesus quoting it? If the Old Testament is with, it's not good for us today, because some people will say, if there's no error, in the old, there's no need for the new. Yes, the Bible may say something like that, but it doesn't mean we should toss the Old Testament away. Because if there's no need for the Old Testament, then Jesus will not quote from it. The apostles will not quote the Old Testament. Praise the Lord. Now look at the third point right there. It was Jesus an accommodator he says, some clever Bible critics have devised the accommodation theory to evade the above conclusion that what we just discussed. What is that? They believe that 
Jesus did not verify this teaching about the Old Testament, but merely accommodated himself to the accepted beliefs of the Jewish people to whom he was speaking. But we all know that that is false. That is false. That is false. Praise God. You can read, I believe we have read, you can read the next uh, paragraph. Then it broke down uh, the accommod accommodation theory and the reason why that theory cannot stand. It cannot stand the test of time. So let me say the test of the historical facts. It cannot stand it. Praise God. But let's look at what Jesus promised about the inspiration of the New Testament. The inspiration of the New Testament. So not only did Jesus confirm the inspiration of the Old Testament, but he promised the inspiration of the New Testament. He promised the inspiration of the New Testament. Although Jesus never wrote any book, he did promise on several occasions that the Holy Spirit would direct his disciples in proclaiming God's truth, in proclaiming God's truth. Amen. Now, Christ and the canonization of the Old Testament. Christ and the canonization of the Old Testament. So Jesus is not only the key to the divine nature of the Old Testament, is also the key to the extent of the Old Testament. Jesus is the key to the Bible, period. To every chapter in the Bible, Jesus is the key. The word canon means rule or norm. So it refers to the sacred writings, which are the rule or norms for faith and practice among the believers. But if I want to simplify uh, canonization, we are talking about the process of compiling the books of the Bible to form the Bible we have today. The process of choosing the inspired uh, word of God and, we, and separate it from the apocrypha. What is the apocrypha? Apocrypha are the books that are written in between Malachi and Matthew. And between Malachi and Matthew, that is a period of 400 years. Uh, this period of 400 years, and the reason why all of these books are not included in the Bible that we have today, because this period of time, there is there's no inspiration at all, no dossier, the Lord, no prophecy, no prophets. And if there's no prophecy, no prophets, no, thus said the Lord, then where do they get the inspiration to write those books? That means it's not inspired by God. That is just human knowledge. It's good. Well, I used to have one of those books. I used to have it just for knowledge's sake. It has nothing to do with our salvation. Because if, if any of them is an inspired word of God, it will be included in the scripture. It will be included in the scripture. And at the convention, we call it Trent Convention or uh, Trent Conference in 1548, if I'm correct, when the Catholic Church, when they came up and decided that this apocrypha, they wanted it to be included in the scripture. And the Protestants disagree because these are not inspired word of God. That's why the Bible we have today is still what we have today. And when we look at Roman Catholic Bible, we have some of this apocrypha in it because they believe that it should be part of the Bible. And like I always say, when we are looking at the interpretation of the Bible, as you are interpreting at the same time, let's apply some common sense. So if there is no 
prophets. There was no thus here the Lord. There's no voice, no word of God, no revelation, no vision for the period of 400 years. And this is the time that these books were written. Where do they get inspiration from? If you want to hide it to the Bible. So that's the reason when John the Baptist, because after 400 years, John the Baptist was the first prophet that now came out. That's why everybody was going after him to hear the word of the Lord, because no one has heard the word of the Lord in four generations. In the past four generations, now they will hear the voice of God again. So everybody was excited about that. That's why they ran after him. They followed him into the wilderness. Now, before John the Baptist, where do these people got the inspiration? to write the book that they wrote. Where did they get the inspiration to write these books? Praise God. All right. The Bible must be interpreted Christocentrically. What do I mean by that? When you are interpreting the Bible, you must have Christ-centeredness at the back of your mind. That Christ is the center of every page of the Bible. Every page. Every page of the Bible. Praise God. You see, three basic senses in which we may see Christ in the Bible. Number one, Christ is the theme of both testaments of the Bible. Number two, Christ is the theme of each of the eight sections. I believe we've read it. We will talk about that in a moment. Christ is the theme of each of the eight sections of the scripture. And Christocentric, Christocentric themes and truth may be found in each of the 66 books of the Bible. If you have read the textbook in detail, you will see, I believe, in chapter 3, towards the end of what we're supposed to read for this class, you will see what Christ represents in each book of the Bible. What each book of the Bible was saying about Jesus Christ. So when you pick up your Bible, you pick up the book of Leviticus, you know you can see Christ in every page as you are reading it. When you pick the Bible, you open the book of Judges, you can see Jesus Christ in every page as you are reading it. Praise God. So that's why it's very important. If we want to interpret the scripture, we must know that Christ is at the center of every book of the Bible, the entire 66 books. Praise the Lord. Now, Christ is the theme. Let's take it one by one. Christ is the theme of the Old and New Testament. The Old Testament views Christ by way of anticipation. And the new view Christ by the way of realization. Praise God. Right now, we are in chapter two. We are talking about Christ is the key to the interpretation of the Bible. Christ is the key to the interpretation of the Bible. When we get to, Lord willing, when we get to uh, hermeneutics, that is uh, the class about studying the interpretation of the scripture. This is going to become much, much more clear. When we learn and when you pick up your Bible, how do I understand what the scripture is saying right here? What does it mean? Where is it coming from? Then we see that Jesus Christ is the key, is the key. So the Old Testament is incomplete without the New Testament. Now, the salvation prepared, prepared for in the Old Testament was provided by Christ in the New Testament. Now we are now digging in into another class called typology. Typology is the study of types and antitypes. And we are talking about typology, we are talking about uh, what happened in the Old Testament. These are the shadow of what is going to happen in the New Testament. Praise God. 
Old Testament points to the New Testament. New Testament is the fulfillment of the prophecy of the Old Testament. So the salvation prepared for in the Old Testament was provided by Christ in the New Testament. The new is in the old concealed and the old is in the new revealed. What the Old Testament foreshadowed, the Christ of the new fulfilled. Let's, let's say something right there. Let me give an exam, uh, some examples right here, probably one or two. Let's look at um, all the ceremonies in the tabernacle in the Old Testament. Remember, we, we, did the, we taught that a little bit in the Pentateuch. Let's look at um, burnt offering. So the lamb for burnt offering is talking about the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross was pointing straight to the cross. So that was a shadow. And when Jesus got on the cross, that was the fulfillment. Let's look at, let's look at Abraham and Isaac when the Lord asked Abraham to offer Isaac as a burnt offering. Isaac was a type of Jesus Christ. Even the lamb, the lamb that was uh, killed in the place of Isaac, that lamb as well was a type of Jesus Christ. So that's what this uh, point is saying right here, that what the Old Testament foreshadowed, the New Testament, I mean, the Christ of the New Testament fulfilled. The Christ of the New Testament fulfilled. All right. So... Christ is the theme of each of the eight sections of the Bible. The first section, law, the law. And that is the foundation that is laid for Christ. All along, I've not been saying, eh, eh. this is a very much, eh, eh. <laughs> please take notes. The law. When we are talking about the law, you know we are talking about Torah. What is Torah? We are talking about the Pentateuch. The five books, the first five books in the Bible, the five books of Moses. So the law is the foundation that is laid for Christ. So look at the first uh, five books of the Bible. Let's see how the foundation is laid for the coming of Christ. Number one, in the book of Genesis, God effects the election. If we pay attention very well, especially in, in Pentateuch, if you pay attention, God chose a race to deal with, a bloodline. And this bloodline is the race he decided to use to, because the purpose is to introduce himself to the world. To, not to introduce, to reintroduce. To reintroduce himself to the world. Then he chose Abraham by the grace of election. By the way of election, he chose Abraham and the seed of Abraham. Abraham to Isaac, Isaac to Jacob, Jacob to Judah. From the tribe, the Messiah will come. Now in Exodus, we saw redemption. Redemption. You see the foundation as the foundation been laid step by step for the coming of Christ. And in Leviticus, guess what? We saw sanctification. Sanctification. Because we are talking about the king of kings is coming. For us to be able to receive him, we have to be holy. We have to be sanctified. When we look at the book of Numbers, how did he lay foundation there? Direction. He gave them direction. And in Deuteronomy, we have instruction. Instruction. Praise God. Okay. Now let's look at historical book. The book of history. In historical book, in order for Christ the King to come through the chosen nation, 
the kingdom are to be established. The kingdom are to be formed. So now, after the book of Deuteronomy, we have Joshua. So how can you, can there be a king without a kingdom? No, they can be. So if we are expecting the king of kings to come, the kingdom has to be formed. The kingdom has to be established. So when we are talking about the original plan of God, because when the Lord told Abraham about his seed, we go to Egypt and for 400 years, then they will return back here. Then when the Lord told Moses, uh, the, the land that I've prepared, that I've given, that I've promised your forefathers, when the Lord told them all of this, it's not just about that generation. It's all about the coming of Christ. It's about the coming of Christ. How can a king come without a kingdom? Without a kingdom. So in the book of Joshua, the Israelites took possession of the land for the kingdom. For the kingdom. In the book of Judges, we see the oppression of the nations because of their disobedience. Because of their disobedience. Now in the book of Ruth, we see devotion within the nation. Why do you think Ruth, there was uh, a Gentile, a Gentile uh, a lady now became one of those that is in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Praise God. You see, a devotion, a devotion. So wherever you go, I go. Wherever you die, I die. Your God will be my God. We see devotion within the nation. And in 1 Samuel, oh Lord, yes, we see long needed stabilization. Long needed, well, well needed stabilization. Because during the time of Samuel, everything that has to do with God, the worship of God Jehovah was restored, was restored. Now in 2 Samuel, we see the expansion of the nation under King David. So now you see how it, we are still going though. You see how historical books are preparation for Christ. They are preparation for Christ. All right. In the first king, we see the period of Israel's glorification under Solomon. And that's first king chapter one, chapters one to 10, 11 to 22. We see the division of the nation into two kingdoms under Solomon's son, Rehoboam. That is a in, in. It's not in your book. Please write it down. Because when the test comes in, oh, but it's not in the book. I'm telling you now, write it down. The division of the nation into two kingdoms happened under the rule of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Solomon's son. That's when the, this, this division, that's when it took place. That's when it happened. All right. In 2 Kings chapters 1 to 17, we saw the deterioration of the northern kingdom of Israel. Why? Because their king, that is now Jeroboam. Don't forget that Solomon's son is Rehoboam. But the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel is Jeroboam. Now, Jeroboam, the reason why this deterioration happened is because Jeroboam then won the entire house of Israel to come back to Jerusalem to worship Jehovah God. Because it was afraid that if they return to Jerusalem, they will return back to the house of Judah and form one united kingdom of Israel again. 
So instead of that, he now installed, or let me say, he raised these um, idols for Israel to worship. And he announced, say, Israel, behold your God that delivered you from the bondage of Egypt. And these are the God of other nations that he now introduced to Israel. That's when deterioration started and everything started going backward. But in 2 Kings 18 to 25, we saw the deportation of the Southern kingdom of Judah. And the Lord warned the kingdom of Judah very well. Don't make the mistake that your sister made. That is the Northern kingdom of Israel. Let me explain the difference between Northern kingdom and Southern kingdom. After the division, or let me say at the point of the division of this kingdom, because under the rule of um, Saul, the first king of Israel, David and Solomon is only one united kingdom of Israel, just one kingdom. But after the death of Solomon and his son Rehoboam uh, became the king of Israel, all the elders and the leaders of each tribe came to Rehoboam. Don't forget Rehoboam is from the house of Judah. That's the tribe of David. Came to the house of David and spoke to the king. Don't do what your father Solomon did to us because he enslaved us. When we read about Solomon, we read so many things, but we never pay attention to what Solomon did. He enslaved the entire house of Israel. He used them like slaves to build his palace, to build his house and to build the house of God, to build the temple. Because those houses, they spent years, years and years and years to build it. And it, it taxed them. They, they have to pay even what they cannot afford to pay. Number one, that's how he got rich. And that's how he was able to build all these things. Now they are telling his son, don't do what your father did. He told them, come back tomorrow. I will have an answer for you. He went to uh, his father's uh, counselors and they told them, don't do what your father did. Listen to them. Then after that, he went to his friend, his age mate, and they told him, are you stupid? Aren't you the king? Your word is the law. So whatever you say, don't, don't listen to all those old, old school. So, and he listened to the young people just like him. The following day, the, the elders of the house of Israel came and he told them, I'm not willing and not ready to do what you are asking. Even my kingdom is going to be more brutal than my father's. And at that point, they make the announcement and say, Israel, back to your tent. Let Judah keep the throne. That's what caused the division. Now, out of the 12 tribes of Israel, we have one standing here, that is the house of Judah, that Rehoboam is ruling over. Now, the tribe of Benjamin, because of the location of the land, because of where they are, so they decided to stay with Judah. But remittent tribes, they moved away and they cut off from the house of Judah. And they formed a new nation called the Northern Kingdom and their capital is Samaria. And the capital for the Southern Kingdom is Jerusalem. Now, when we are talking is the Southern Kingdom that we call the Jews, not the entire house of Israel. It's on, when we are talking about the Jews or the Jewish, is only the Southern Kingdom, the Kingdom of Judah. During the time of Jesus Christ, those are the area we call the Judea. Because at that point, the 10th tribe, the Northern Kingdom of Israel, they've been taken into slavery and 
they scattered all over the world. That's why we call them the lost 10 tribes of Israel. They're lost all over the world. But glory to God now, since 1948, they started coming back. They started coming back in the fulfillment of the book of Ezekiel chapter 37, the dry bone in the valley. So they started coming back. The dry bone is coming alive again. The dry bones is coming alive. So what brought all this up is the uh, Second Kings chapters 1 to 17 and Second Kings chapter 18 to 25. And we are talking about the deportation of the southern kingdom of Judah because of what northern kingdom did and God sent them into slavery. The southern kingdom, the Lord sent so many prophets to warn them so they will not suffer the same fate. But they didn't list. So they have to go through the same thing. That's why Nebuchadnezzar came and took them into slavery as well. But one thing that God did not do for the northern kingdom, he did for the southern kingdom. And what is that? God did not promise the northern kingdom to return from slavery. But the southern kingdom, God gave them a definite time that they would be in slavery. So for 70 years. For 70 years. And after 70 years, they started returning. That's why Cyrus gave them emancipation and released them to go and rebuild the city and rebuild the temple of God. Praise God. And in First Chronicle, we saw the reveal of the prophetic history of Samuel and kings show the deprivation. Now, let's look at uh, the poetical book. The poetical books is talking about the aspiration for Christ is expressed. Aspiration for Christ is expressed. So all of the poet, poetic aspirations of the Israelites arise out of the previous historical settings. Let's look in the book of Job. We saw that in suffering, they aspired for mediation. In Psalm, the aspiration for communion. In Proverbs, the aspiration for wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, the aspiration for ultimate satisfaction. In Songs of Solomon, we saw the longing for union in love. Mm. Now, let's look at the prophecy, the prophetical book. We saw the expectation of Christ, the expectation of Christ. So now, in Osea, Joel and Amos, we saw the hope for national restoration by Christ. In Isaiah and Micah, we saw the international salvation through Christ. That's when we saw the idea that salvation is going to be extended to the Gentiles. In Obadiah, Jonah, Nahum, Abakot, and Zephaniah, we saw the retribution of Christ on the sinful nations. In Jeremiah, we saw the future covenant reaffirmation. In Ezekiel, the glorious restoration by Christ. In Daniel, political destination in God's kingdom. In Haggai and Zechariah, we saw Israel's religious restoration through Christ. In Malachi, we saw the need for Israelites' moral reconstruction by Christ. Moral reconstruction by Christ. Mm. Now let's look at the gospel. Gospel is talking about the manifestation of Christ. In Matthew, Christ manifests in his sovereignty as king to the Jews, as king to the Jews. Mm. I believe we did this, uh, we went through this in, um, what's the class that nobody likes? <laughs> that every, everybody everybody couldn't wait to get to just let's just get over this class please let's just forget about this class and move on <laughs> somebody remind me the name of that class <laughs> synoptic. 
It's a nothing Nothing. gospel. I know everybody is is happy to mention that. But woof, that's over. Praise God. (laughs) The synoptic gospel. So we went through this in the synoptic gospel. Matthew, in Matthew, Christ manifests in his sovereignty as king to the Jews. In Mark, Christ manifests in his ministry as servant to the Romans. In Luke, Christ manifests in his perfect humanity as man to the Greek. In John, hallelujah, Christ manifests in his deity as God to the whole world, to the whole world. So the Old Testament hope became the New Testament reality when deity entered into man's history, into human history. Praise God. So now at, we saw the propagation of Christ. The worldwide propagation of Christ began in Jerusalem. That is from chapters one to six. In surrounding, in the surrounding Judea, we saw that in chapter seven. In Samaria, in chapter eight, but to the whole world, in chapters nine to 28, nine to 28. Now, in the epistles, so if you notice what we are doing now is that Christ is the theme of each of the eight sections of the Bible. So that's why we had started taking it section by section. In the epistle, we say the interpretation and application of Christ. In the book of Romans, we saw the redemption in Christ. In 1 Corinthians, we saw the sanctification in Christ. 2 Corinthians, we saw the jubilation or triumph in Christ. In Galatians, we saw the believer's emancipation in Christ. In Ephesians, we saw the exhortation and resultant unification in Christ. In Philippians, we saw Christian exhortation, that is joy, Christian's joy in Christ. In Colossians, the completion in Christ. In 1 Thessalonians, the expectation in Christ. 2 Thessalonians, the future glorification in Christ that is coming. 1 Timothy, the urge to faithfulness in Christ. 2 Timothy, soundness in Christ. Titus, the life of steadfastness in Christ. Philemon, the act of benefaction in Christ. Hebrew, the exhortation to perfection. In James, the exhortation to wisdom in Christ. First Peter, the exhortation to submission in Christ. Second Peter, the exhortation to purification in Christ. First John, the exhortation to communion with Christ. Second John, the exhortation to a continuation in Christ. Third John, the contribution for the cause of Christ. Jude, the exhortation to stand in contention for the faith of Christ. And Revelation, we saw the consummation of all things, the consummation of all things in Christ. If we can go to pages 24 to 25, right there, we don't have to go through it. You can read that um, when you have time. I believe we have read it. You can see Christ, how Christ is found in each of the 66 books of the Bible. 66 books of the Bible. So you can see it right there. Like in the book of Number, he is the smitten rock. The smitten rock. So in the book of Second Corinthians is our sufficiency. Sufficiency. Zevaniah, the king of Israel. Zechariah, the righteous branch. So just let's take time to go through it. You will see Christ in every page of the Bible. All right. The general structure of the Old Testament. Now we're in part two, which is the book of the law, the books of the law. Now let's look at the introduction to the books of the law. 
So the general structure of the Old Testament, we see that the early twofold in very early of uh, the collection of the Bible, we see that the Old Testament is divided into two, the law and the prophets. The law is the Torah, the Pentateuch, from Genesis to Deuteronomy. But the prophets is from Joshua to Malachi, from Joshua to Malachi, right? And when we look at these two, this early two division of the Old Testament, you see, there are several reasons for believing that this two division was the original and most basic format of the Old Testament. Let's look at this reason briefly. Number one, it is the primary way the New Testament refers to the division of the Old Testament. Jesus mentioned it, the apostle mentioned it, they call it the law and the prophets, the law and the prophets. Even within the Old Testament itself, there was basic distinction made bet between the writings of Moses and the prophets. And during the period between the Old and New Testament, the second book of Maccabees mentioned the law and the prophets. That's one of uh, the, book, the books of Apocrypha, the Maccabees. And the Qumran community of Dead Sea Scroll, they consistently refer to the Old Testament as the law and the prophets, the law and the prophets. Praise God. I was privileged to visit that uh, Qumran where the scroll, all these Old Testament we're talking, where the scrolls were found. I was blessed to visit the place. It's very interesting. Anyway, that's for another day. So this twofold division included 39 books of the Old Testament and is confirmed from several sources. Number one, Jesus and the New Testament writers cite 18 of the 22 books of Jewish law and prophets. The fragments of all but one, that's the book of Esther, of the 22 books of the Old Testament were discovered in the Dead Sea Scroll. Even Josephus, the first century, cent the first century uh, Jewish historian is one of the most popular among all the historians, uh, Jewish historians, list 24 books of the Old Testament. And Jesus declared that the Lord and prophets were all scriptures of the Jews. Even the apostle Paul defended his orthodox by saying he believed that everything laid down by the Lord or writing in the prophets, in the prophets. Then after the two four division, then we see the threefold division of the Jewish Old Testament. Let's look at this for a minute. If you can come with me to, we are now in page 30, page 30 of the textbook. You see the threefold uh, division of the Jewish Old Testament right there. Let's first look at uh, before the time of Christ, it, there was an alley within the Jewish circle to, defy, to divide the prophets into two sections. But right here now, we see that it's divided into three. Before the time of Christ, at uh, the time of Christ, and after the time of Christ. What does that really even mean? Let's look at it. That in the prologue to the Apocrypha book of uh, Siraj, the writers refer to the law and the prophets and the other books of our father. He mentioned that these books had been read by his grandfather. This is before the time of Christ. Don't forget that the, the, book of, the books of Apocrypha were written between Malachi and Matthew. Jesus had not been born then. Okay, let's look at the time of Christ. The Jewish philosopher Philo lived in 
lived at Alexandria and made allusion to a possible three for division of the Old Testament. When he spoke of the law, number two, the oracle delivered through the mouth of prophets. Number three, some and anything else which foster perfect knowledge and piety. At this point, so it was divided into three, divided into three. We know the first one that everybody believes is the original division of the Bible. There are only two divisions, the law and the prophets. Now we have three. We have the law, the prophets, and the writings. The law, the prophets, and writings. Let's quickly look after, let's look at after the time of Christ. You see, uh, Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, referred to the 22 books of the Hebrew Old Testament. He identified them as five belonging to Moses, the prophets in 13 books. The remaining four books containing aims to God and, perhaps, and, and precept for the conduct of human life. Now he's talking about poetical books, the poems from Job, uh, Psalm, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, and Song of Solomon. By the fifth century AD, at the latest, the Jewish Mishnah, that is uh, Baba Batra, listed 11 books in the third section of the Old Testament called Writings, that is Ketubim. Since that time, Jewish Bible have continued to use the following arrangement. And what following arrangement is that? The law of Moses, that is Torah, it contains five books. The prophets, that is Nebihim, contain eight books. And that is divided into two. We have former prophets and latter prophets. What about writings? In writings, we have 11 books. We have poetical books, five roles, and historical books. Isn't that interesting? Poetical books, five roles, and historical books. Hmm. Then after that, now we have fourfold division of the Old Testament. Fourfold. Amen. We have the law, that is five books, book, books of history, 12 books. We have poetry, five books, and we have prophets, 17 books. And even prophets is divided into two. We have major prophets and minor prophets. And if, okay, now let's, I want us to compare and contrast right here. Let's look at where it, we have a uh, three-fold division. We have law, we have prophets, we have writings. Let's look on that prophet. We have former prophets and latter prophets. But in the fourfold division, when we look at prophets, we didn't use the word former and latter. We have major prophets and minor prophets. Because those that are considered as former prophets, those uh, Joshua and the book of Judges, Samuel and the book of Kings, later prophets, we have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12. You see, the word the 12 is talking about the minor prophets. Start from Osea all the way to Malachi. Now, when we come down to the fourfold division, you see, right there, minor prophet, there are 12 books from Osea to Malachi. But the major prophets, they are Isaiah, Jeremiah. There are actually four, but five books. Because lamentation is included. And lamentation was written by Jeremiah. That's why the Bible says the lamentation of Jeremiah, of prophet Jeremiah. All right. Now let's look at the primary emphasis in each section 
of the Old Testament. He said, in the law, we laid down the fundamental moral principle, underline the word moral. Moral principle, which were to guide the Israelites in being a holy people. That's in the law. What about the book of history? In the book of history, we see the national life of Israel in their conquest of a land. That's in the book of Joshua. And a king in the book of Samuel, as well as the final division and destruction of their kingdom in the book of Kings. Now, in the book of poetry, there's a record of the Jewish spiritual life. That's the book of Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. These books are known as wisdom literature. The books of prophecy lay special stress on the future messianic life of Israel. Future messianic life of Israel. Mm. Now, the structure of the law. Let's look at the names of the books of the law. The English name. The English name of the first five books of the Bible are derived from Latin titles, which were taken from the Greek Old Testament. From the Greek Old Testament. Look, let's look at those names. We are in page 33. In page 33. You see, Genesis means the origin or the beginning. Origin or the beginning. Exodus means going out or departure. Leviticus means the book of the Levite. The book of the Levite. Numbers is talking about numbering or counting or we may say censors. Deuteronomy, that's the second law or second giving of the Lord. But let's look at the Hebrew names. This is very interesting. The names of the books of the Torah in the Hebrew Bible are taken from the first words of each book. The book of Genesis, that is called Bereshit. Bereshit means in the beginning. In the beginning, let's look at Exodus. In Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible, it is called Shemoth, which means names. And if you look at your Bible, you see these are the words that begin the, the first chapter and first verse of these books. Leviticus, in the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew name is called Waigra which means an e chord, an e chord. Numbers is called Bemidba, which means in the wilderness. And Deuteronomy is called Devery, which means words, words. Hmm. Let's look at the time period covered in the book of Moses in, in the Pentateuch. Let's look at it, the time period that each book covers. In the book of Genesis, is from the creation of the world to the bondage of Israel in Egypt. That's from creation to 1860 BC. Exodus is from the sojourn of Israel in Egypt to Mount Sinai. That is 1860 to 1447 BC. And the book of Leviticus is only for 30 days, only one month. Between Exodus and Numbers, it's only one month. The book of Numbers is from Mount Sinai to the end of 40 years wandering. That is 1447 to 1407, 40 years, 40 years. And Deuteronomy is from the end of wandering to after Moses' funeral. That is about two months. About two months. It's about two months. All right. Let's look at the 
theme of the book of the law. The book of Genesis is talking about the election. The theme is election of the nation. Exodus, the redemption of the nation. Levitical, the sanctification of the nation. If you don't forget, we mentioned this earlier on. Number, a direction of the nations. And Deuteronomy, the instruction of the nations. But to wrap it up tonight, let's look at the bloodline of the coming Messiah. The bloodline of the coming Messiah. I mentioned it briefly earlier on as well. It started with the seed of the woman in the book of Genesis, chapter 3. The seed of the woman, or let's say the human race. Then from that to the line of Seth, because after Cain killed Abel, he was replaced by Seth. Then from line of Seth to the offspring of Shem. We know Shem, that is uh, Noah's son. Noah's son. From the off offspring of Shem comes the family of Abraham. And from Abraham, we have the seed of Isaac. There is one book, Lord willing, uh, before our next class, Holy Spirit will, re will remind me, I will bring it so we can see it. I will recommend. I know I've recommended it in the Bible study before. Probably many of us already have it, but if you don't, I would love you to get it if you can. You don't need it for class, but you need it for knowledge. So because what we are talking about right here, you will see it in black and white in picture right in front of you, still like a chart. It's called the, uh, the panorama of the Bible, the panorama. So by God's grace, ne by, by next week, I will bring it to class so we can see, because what we are talking about right here, you will see it drawn, how the blood from the Garden of Eden, when the Lord uh, sacrificed a lamb and gave them the cloth, uh, the, the skin, the cloth skin or whatever we call the skin cloth, the skin of the animal to wear uh, when he cast them out of the garden, from there, you see the flow of the blood, that blood of that lamb, how it flows all the way to the cross. And how the bloodline we are talking about, where the son of man, where the lamb of sacrifice will come from. You see how that the, the bloodline, how we can trace it from, from the garden all the way to the birth of Christ. So right here, so from the family of Abraham, we see the seed of Isaac. From the seed of Isaac, we see the sons of Jacob. And among the sons of Jacob, we see the tribe of Judah, where Jesus Christ, we come from. That's why we call him the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So is there any question before we wrap it up tonight. Any question? So we are right on time. It's just one hour class. So if there's no question, so I welcome every again. Welcome back to class. God bless you and bless you and bless you. And this semester we are so blessed. Pastor uh, Chris is coming full time. Glory to God for that. So, and so we'll be teaching a New Testament survey, and it's going to be every Friday at six o'clock, 6 p.m. Eastern time. So we look forward to that. I know it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be glorious because the man of God is anointed. And I believe he's a great teacher. If not, it will not be here. <laughs> we give God praise for that. So God bless everyone. So let's wrap it up tonight. So by next week, we give us the first assignment of this semester, and that will be reflection of what we did today. If I were you, I would go over it again and again and again. It's going to be just one page 
reflection of what we did today. So if you have, um, so if you have, oh, never mind about that. Anyway, so if we, we can look into the syllabus, you will see the pages that we need to read for the next class. That will be uh, pages 37 to 63. Pages 37 to 63. Please, uh, let's read it before we come to class. Then when we come to class, we just discuss it. God bless you. Because we've read it, you see, instead of two hours, it's just one hour class because we've read it. So if we didn't, then we spend more time in class than we should. Okay, there is. When can we have the recording? God bless you. We show, if you do not have it on YouTube tonight, you should have it tomorrow. I just, let's just pray that it's recorded. <laughs> I believe I praise the recording, so <laughs> let's hope that it's recorded. So, and it's blinking right here, so that tells me that it's recording. So, so, so by that we show. If you don't have it tonight, we have it by tomorrow. But I will try to put it up tonight. God bless you. Any other? Okay, thank you. I was late. Oh, it is well, woman of God. God bless you. God bless you. All right, if there's no other question or comments, let's wrap it up tonight. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we bless your name because you are faithful. You are good. You are true to your word. We pray, O oh Lord, as we started at your feet tonight. Holy Spirit, we pray for divine understanding. Let your spirit come, O oh God, to explain it even better than in our instructor. Speak to our spirit, man. Help us to understand it. Give us divine knowledge, wisdom from heaven above in the name of Jesus Christ. Give us divine revelation of your word in the name of Jesus Christ. And above it all, we pray that we will not take all this in vain. Give us the grace to fulfill the assignments that you have given us. The grace to fulfill our calling so that we will not disappoint you in the name of Jesus Christ. So at the end of it all, we will not be a castaway. Thank you, Heavenly Father. As we are going to our different places. Holy Spirit, let your presence be with us. You promised, you told Moses, I will send my angels to go before you, to lead you along the way. So Holy Spirit, we pray that you will send your angels to go before us, wherever we go, whatever we do, so that whatever we do may bring glory and honor to your name. Thank you, each end of days, we give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. God bless everyone. Please have a wonderful evening.